Since childhood, I had a dream to have my own small but profitable business. A beautiful wife and at least three children, two boys, and one girl. It was my meaning of life for which I was ready to do anything. But as usually happens, life throws us unrealistic difficulties to test our strength. And so, one fine evening all my dreams collapsed when I saw my wife and her lover in the kitchen who wanted to talk to me. My name is Jeffrey Mason, and I have always dreamed of owning my own business. My dream began to turn into reality thanks to the tireless support of my father, who believed in me more than I believed in myself. Since childhood, I remember sitting with my father in our small kitchen, filled with the aromas of freshly baked bread and freshly brewed coffee. He would tell me stories about his youth, about how he traveled and discovered different cultures through food and drinks. These stories inspired me to dream about my own cafe, a place where people could gather together, enjoying delicious food and feeling at home. After graduating from college, armed with knowledge and endless enthusiasm, I decided it was time to turn my dream into reality. My father was my main assistant and mentor on this path. He not only gave me the initial capital, accumulated over years of his labor, but also something much more valuable, confidence in myself and belief in success. The first months were incredibly difficult. I worked without days off, starting early in the morning and finishing late at night. Despite the fatigue, I felt an incredible excitement from doing something important, something of my own. Our efforts began to bear fruit, and as soon as the cafe started making a profit, my father left me saying that from now on, I had to do everything myself. A year later, the cafe had reached a modest but stable income, and I felt that I could breathe a little and allow myself not only to work, but also to live. It was at that moment that Jane entered my life. We met completely by chance, on one of those rare days when I decided to take a break and go for a walk in the park nearby my cafe. I remember that day as if it were yesterday. Bright sun, a gentle breeze, and an unexpected meeting that turned my life upside down. Jane was sitting on a bench reading a book, completely engrossed in it. I was walking by when the wind decided to play a trick and tore a page out of her book. I hurried to help her catch the flying leaf, and that's how our conversation started. She thanked me and we began to chat about books, our favorite genres, and how important it is to sometimes take a break and enjoy the moment. I learned that she was a college student, studying to be a lawyer. Her intelligence and wit instantly attracted me. Before I knew it, we had spent the entire evening together, walking through the park and sharing stories from our lives. From that day on, our friendship only grew stronger. We began to spend more and more time together, and I soon realized that I couldn't imagine my life without Jane. She not only supported me in everything related to the cafe, but also inspired me to be better. I loved her for her kindness, intelligence, and ability to see in me what I could not see in myself. I took care of her, and eventually after a couple of months I proposed to her in my own cafe. Since I didn't have much money, we decided to have a wedding and buy a house on credit. I was confident that I would be able to pay off the debts in the near future. Riding the wave of our cafe's success and the stability we began to feel, a pivotal moment came in our life together. Jane received a job offer she couldn't refuse. Roger Novak, a young and ambitious lawyer whom we both knew through mutual acquaintances, offered her to become his assistant. At that time, Roger was just starting his practice and was looking for talented people to build a successful team. Jane was excited about this offer. She believed it would be a great opportunity for personal and professional growth. Although I thought our business was doing well enough and she didn't need to work, Jane wanted to contribute to the family budget and develop in a new direction. I supported her decision as I saw how eager she was to take on this challenge. Roger Novak turned out to be an impressive person. He was not only smart and goal-oriented, but also had a charisma that attracted people. In the first few months of working, Jane often told me about her achievements and how much she was learning. The job took a lot of time, but she seemed happy and full of energy. I enjoyed seeing her light up with new ideas and tasks that Roger set before her. Sometimes I wondered if she was spending too much time at work, but I understood that it was important for her, 
Working with Roger gave her a sense of satisfaction and success that I didn't want to take away. Jane and I have always been a team, and I knew it was important to support each other in our endeavors. Therefore, despite my slight concerns about her new job, I tried to be a pillar of support for her. Ultimately, our ability to support and inspire each other only made our bond stronger. Over time, I began to notice changes that initially seemed insignificant to me. Jane was spending less and less time at home. I realized that her job was not only taking her time but also the energy that we could have spent together, having sex, watching movies, going for walks, and so on. The evenings when we used to sit down for dinner discussing our day and sharing plans for the future have become rare. Jane often came home late, tired, and the only thing she wanted was to be in silence. I tried to show my support by cooking dinner or offering help around the house, but an invisible distance grew between us, which only increased over time. Talks about the future and our shared dreams were replaced by short messages about the need to work late or sudden business meetings. My attempts to talk about how I missed our evenings together often ended with Jane talking about the importance of her work and how important it was for her. I tried to understand and accept this, but deep down, I began to feel resentment and loneliness. Moreover, I started to notice that Jane became more reserved regarding her work. If previously she shared every little detail with enthusiasm, now her stories became general and unclear. Sometimes it seemed to me that she avoided talking about work, especially when I asked questions about her meetings with Roger. One evening, when Jane came home late again, I decided to address this issue. I asked her if she was spending too much time at work and whether we should try to find a balance between work and personal life. Jane's response surprised me. She said that work was an opportunity for her to grow at the moment and that I should be more understanding. Her words sounded reasonable, but their tone made me feel a distance that alarmed me. As time went on, her boss, the lawyer, achieved great heights becoming the best in our city. He bought a house and drove an expensive Jeep. To be honest, I even envied him, because I was stuck in my business and didn't feel the growth I had experienced before, and I greatly missed Jane's support, who seemed to have distanced herself from me. I tried to start a conversation about having children, thinking that a child in the family would give me more motivation to develop, but Jane said she didn't want to rush into it. Time had passed, it was an ordinary day. I closed the cafe later than usual, having stayed back to chat with the last few customers who had become almost like friends over the years. On my way home, I pondered how to suggest to Jane that we spend the weekend together, perhaps go somewhere to feel closer to each other again. As I approached our house, I found it odd that the light was on in the living room. Jane usually came back late and rarely waited for me downstairs. With a sense of foreboding, I unlocked the door and entered. In the kitchen, sitting at the glass table, was Jane. Her expression was serious and somewhat tired. But what surprised me most was the presence of a third person, Roger Novak. He sat opposite her, looking as if his being there was the most natural thing in the world. We need to talk, Jane began as I approached. Her tone was calm, but carried a certainty that alarmed me. Roger nodded at me in greeting, but said nothing. Jane continued, and each word hit me like an icy rain. She spoke about how our relationship had changed, how she felt lost between work and home, and that she had found comfort and understanding in Roger. She didn't mention the word affair, but every phrase was imbued with that meaning. Then, as if from afar, I heard her request for a divorce. On the table in front of me lay the papers, neatly folded and ready for signing. In that moment, the world around me froze. I couldn't believe that this was happening to me, to us. My first impulse was to reject her words, to say that we could fix everything, that we should try again. But Jane's look was decisive, and Roger's presence spoke volumes. Roger intervened, his voice calm and confident. He offered no apologies, nor did he try to soften the blow. Instead, he spoke of the practical aspects, how this would be better for all of us. His words sounded cold and calculating, and there was not a hint of regret in his eyes. I sat, unable to rise, trying to understand how my life, my dreams, were crumbling before my eyes. Questions swirled in my head, 
but I couldn't utter a word. Jane asked me to sign the papers, but I couldn't. Everything in me resisted this decision. Everything inside me screamed in despair and rejection of this reality. I can't sign these papers, finally escaped me when I found the strength to speak. My voice trembled, but I tried to remain calm even though a storm raged inside. Jane looked at me with regret in her eyes, but her resolve did not waver. Jeffrey, please understand. This is the best solution for both of us, she softly said, trying to convince me. But how could I understand? How could I agree that our shared life, memories, dreams could be erased with a single stroke of the pen? Roger stood up. His facial expression was impassive. Jeffrey, I don't want this to sound like a threat, but if you don't sign these papers voluntarily, we'll have to resolve this matter through court. And believe me, Jane has a good chance of winning the case. His words were cold, and I realized he was not going to back down. He was ready to go all the way to achieve his desired outcome. I won't sign, I firmly repeated, trying to look Roger directly in the eyes, searching for a hint of understanding or sympathy. But there was nothing there, just cold calculation. Then we'll have to do this the hard way. I know how much you value your business, don't you? Roger calmly said, folding the papers and rising from the table. He nodded towards Jane. She stood up and headed out with him. I watched from the window as they crossed the street and got into Roger's Jeep, leaving me alone in my house. The next morning after that unforgettable and painful evening, I woke up with a heavy heart. The night was restless. Sleep was fitful and filled with anxious thoughts about the future. The first thing I decided was to seek legal help. I needed someone who could objectively assess my situation and offer possible courses of action. I remembered Mr. Osborne, an experienced lawyer specializing in family law, whom friends had once mentioned. Without hesitation, I dialed his number. The meeting was scheduled for the same day. Mr. Osborne greeted me in his office with a professional smile, but his expression quickly turned serious as I began to share my situation. He listened attentively, interrupting me only to clarify details. After I finished, he paused for a moment, as if weighing his words. Jeffrey, your situation is complicated, but not hopeless, he began, his tone conveying confidence. First and foremost, we need to gather evidence that the divorce was initiated not due to your fault. This will help protect your interests in court. I nodded, understanding that it would not be easy. The idea of collecting evidence against Jane was very challenging. Mr. Osborne suggested hiring a private detective who could assist in this matter. It's standard practice in such cases, he explained. We must be fully prepared for the court proceedings. Leaving Mr. Osborne's office, I felt somewhat comforted. I took the detective's number but decided to call him a bit later, needing time to think everything over. After the meeting with Mr. Osborne, I went to a cafe and spent my usual workday, and in the evening, I drove to my empty house. I had just parked the car and was heading to the door of my house when I saw a figure standing in the shadow at my porch. My heart raced as I recognized the person as Roger Novak. His presence here at such a time was the last thing I expected. We need to talk, Jeffrey, he said, emerging from the darkness. His voice was calm, but there was a hidden threat in his tone. I stopped, ready for confrontation. No, Roger, there's nothing more to discuss. Everything will be settled in court, I replied firmly, trying not to show my agitation. Roger stepped closer, his gaze now stern and unyielding. You're making a big mistake by refusing to sign those papers, Jeffrey. It could turn against you in the most unpleasant way. I felt anger rising within me. Threats won't make me change my decision. I will fight for what I believe is right. I said, feeling my resolve strengthen in the face of his threats. Roger smirked, but there was no warmth in his smile. We'll see what you'll say when all this is over, Jeffrey. Look at yourself, you're a loser. I always knew Jane would leave you. She talked about your successful cafe and how you were drowning in debts. You're not needed by her. What are you fighting for? Clown. He said these words with such self-admiration and they struck me so deeply that I couldn't hold back and with the words, I'm fighting for my honor. 
I hit Roger squarely in the face with all my strength, making him stagger back and cover his face with his hands. Then I delivered a second blow straight to his large stomach, causing him to double over. Stop it! What are you doing? Roger began to shout. I delivered the third blow with the words, Don't you dare come near my house again! And Roger hastily ran to his car. I was shocked by the fact that Roger had taken my wife, most likely slept with her, and still dared to threaten me. I had always been calm, but now it felt as if someone else had possessed me. The next morning I called a detective and we scheduled a meeting in his office for lunchtime that same day. He introduced himself as Mr. Clark, a middle-aged man with a piercing gaze and a business-like attitude. I told him about my situation, putting emotions aside, and trying to be as precise as possible with the details. Mr. Clark listened attentively, occasionally asking clarifying questions. We can start by observing Mr. Novak and try to gather information about his interactions with your wife, he suggested after I had finished. This will help us obtain evidence that can be used in court. I nodded, agreeing with his plan. We discussed the details, including potential risks and the cost of his services. Although the price was high, I understood that the stakes in this game were even higher. Hence, I agreed without hesitation. I will do my utmost to assist you, Mr. Mason, and try to gather material in the coming days, Mr. Clark assured me as we concluded our meeting. Returning home, I pondered how my life had turned into something akin to a detective novel, where every step could lead to unpredictable consequences. However, I was ready to go all the way to protect what was dear to me, even if it meant playing by rules I did not like. A few days after hiring Mr. Clark, my life fell into a rhythm of waiting and tension. Every day I opened the cafe trying to focus on work, but my thoughts constantly returned to the possible outcomes of the detective's investigation. I tried to remain strong, but internal anxiety gave me no peace. It was during these days when I felt most vulnerable that what I least expected happened. One day, while I was working in the cafe, Roger Novak approached me. He was not alone. A man who appeared to be his bodyguard was standing next to him. Seeing Roger in my cafe, especially after our last conversation, instantly filled the atmosphere with tension. We need to talk, Jeffrey, in a quiet place, Roger began. His voice sounded calm, but determination was evident in his eyes. I felt anger rising within me. I've already told you, Roger, we're done talking. Everything will be resolved in court, I replied, trying to keep myself under control. In response, he just smirked, and then his gaze hardened. Do you really think you can win? I'm offering you a last chance to avoid public humiliation. I rejected his offer, feeling my patience snap. Your threats don't scare me, Roger. Leave my cafe, I said clearly and decisively. What happened next unfolded with incredible speed. I turned away to call security in my office, and at that moment, Roger lunged at me, knocked me to the ground, and began beating me while saying, What, you little pup? Thought you could beat me and get away with it unpunished. He was like a dog that had broken off its leash, pounding on me for about 40 seconds. I was barely able to comprehend what was happening. When I tried to resist, the thug he had brought to my cafe prevented me from doing so. In the end, I was lucky that a patrol car was parked near my cafe, and the police quickly responded coming to my aid and detaining the frenzied lawyer. We were taken to the police station, where I was the victim, and Roger tried to claim that I was the first to attack him, but witnesses and camera footage said otherwise. I was released, while Roger was kept at the station and was prohibited from approaching me. A few days after the attack, Mr. Clark contacted me, stating that he had important information. We met in a quiet cafe, away from prying eyes, he took out several photos and documents from his briefcase, which, according to him, could be key in the case against Roger Novak and prove his wrongful actions towards me and Jane. The photos captured meetings between Jane and Roger in an informal setting, which in itself was not direct proof of infidelity, but supported my suspicions and could be used to support my case of marriage breakdown due to external interference. Moreover, Mr. Clark managed to gather evidence that Roger used his influence to pressure me and my business activities, which could be interpreted as an attempt to harm my well-being. These are very important pieces of evidence, Jeffrey, Mr. Clark said as he handed me the documents. 
They could play a key role in your case, proving that Mr. Novak's actions were aimed at destroying your marriage and threatening your business. I carefully reviewed the materials provided, feeling a surge of strength and confidence. Finally, I had something that could help me fight for justice. I thanked Mr. Clark for his work and asked him to continue monitoring Roger, hoping to gather even more evidence of his guilt. Preparing for the trial consumed all my thoughts and time, but unfortunately, Jane did not contact me once during all those days, which hurt me. However, I realized that I had already lost this person. Each day as the hearing date approached, I felt a mix of determination and anxiety. Working in the cafe became not only a source of income for me, but also a refuge from personal storms. Nevertheless, I knew I couldn't allow my personal issues to affect my professional life. Since our last meeting, Mr. Clark continued to provide me with additional evidence and information that could be used in court. Since Jane and I were still legally married, photographs of her kissing another man would be significant proof of her infidelity. On the eve of the trial, I felt emotionally and physically exhausted. Gathering evidence, endless discussions with Mr. Osborne, and the internal struggle with my own feelings took their toll on me. But I knew I couldn't afford to break down. Too much was at stake, and I was determined to see this through to the end, regardless of the outcome. The day of the court hearing arrived faster than I expected, and I felt simultaneously ready and utterly unprepared for what was to come. Mr. Osborne assured me that we had done everything possible to prepare for this day. He detailed the process of the trial and what arguments would be presented in defense of my position. Arriving at the courthouse, I was engulfed by a mix of excitement and tension. The corridors buzzed with legal hustly, but for me, the world seemed to pause in anticipation. In the courtroom, I saw Jane and Roger for the first time in several months. Jane looked calm, which only added to my nervousness. Roger, on the other hand, appeared as confident as ever. As the hearing began, I tried to focus on every word spoken by the judge and the lawyers. Mr. Osborne effectively laid out our arguments, highlighting Roger's wrongful actions and their impact on my personal and professional life, and how my wife had been unfaithful during our marriage. He presented the evidence we had collected, including photographs and testimonies, to support our position. However, when it was Jane's lawyer's turn to speak, my anxiety intensified. He presented their version of events, trying to portray Jane in the most favorable light and justify her decision to seek a divorce. Jane claimed that I had resorted to physical force against her, and she had fled to her employer. Although I tried to remain calm, it was difficult to listen as they attempted to justify actions that had caused me so much pain. I just wanted to get divorced and forget all of this like a bad dream. The days of waiting for the court's decision seemed to stretch on endlessly. Every phone call made my heart freeze in anticipation of news, but time passed, and there were no updates from Mr. Osborne. My life was momentarily paused in waiting, and I tried to occupy myself with work at the cafe to distract myself from the obsessive thoughts about the trial. Finally, on one of the clear autumn days, when the leaves had already started to turn yellow and fall, a call came through. It was Mr. Clark. His voice sounded firm and calm as always, but I immediately felt that he was bearing important news. The court has made its decision, Jeffrey, he began, and my heart started beating faster. The court has found our side's arguments to be valid. Your marriage to Jane will be dissolved at your request on the grounds of the evidence we provided of her guilt in the destruction of marital relations. I froze, trying to catch every word, afraid of missing something important. And what about Roger? I asked barely catching my breath. As for Mr. Novak, the court has ruled in your favor. He will be issued a restraining order against contacting you, and he will also be required to pay you compensation for emotional distress and cover the legal costs. The compensation will be substantial, Mr. Osborne continued. These words felt like a heavy weight was lifted off me. I felt relief mixed with the bitterness of understanding that this process had definitively put an end to my relationship with Jane but at the same time, I felt a sense of satisfaction that justice had prevailed. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. I couldn't have managed without your help, I said, feeling my voice tremble with emotion. I'm glad I could help, Jeffrey. 
If you have any more questions or need further assistance, know that I'm always at your service, he replied. And after a few words of farewell, we concluded the conversation. Hanging up the phone, I closed my eyes for a moment, trying to process everything that had happened. After all, this all started on an evening when my wife, or rather now ex-wife, decided to bring her lover into our home and insist on an amicable divorce. In the end, Jane couldn't take anything from me. Not only did she betray me, but she also slandered me, which left her owing me instead. Jane and Roger found themselves out of work because after the incident where the lawyer attacked me in the cafe, he lost his position and was no longer allowed to practice his profession. I don't know how things are going for them now, but it's clearly worse than for me. I saw Roger driving some cheap foreign car instead of his Jeep, which looked pitiful. But I didn't care about them. I wanted to get my life on track. The first step towards a new life was the decision to sell the house that Jane and I had once chosen together. Selling the house turned out not to be as difficult a task as I had initially thought. The real estate market was favorable and soon I found a buyer. The funds from the house sale gave me financial freedom and the opportunity to look at my life from a new angle. I decided that the first thing I would do was update my car, which had served me faithfully for many years. But most importantly, I decided to invest in the development of my cafe. This place became not just a business for me, but a part of my soul, a place where I found solace in the hardest times. I realized I wanted to see it thrive, to become even more cozy and welcoming a place where people would come for warmth and comfort. As the cafe was rejuvenated, I felt rejuvenated as well. Putting so much effort and soul into this place, I saw my life in a new light. Every new guest in the cafe, every positive review, reminded me that even in the darkest times, it's possible to find light and hope for the better. With each day, I became more aware that re-evaluation and change are an inevitable part of life. They can be painful and scary, but at the same time, they offer the opportunity for growth and new beginnings. My cafe became a symbol of such rebirth, a place where one can leave behind the difficulties of the past and find hope for a better future. I started meeting new people, whose company brought me joy and inspiration. Every cafe visitor brought their own story, and I found pleasure in listening to their tales. These encounters reminded me that life is full of surprises, and that even in the darkest periods, it's possible to find sources of light. Now, looking ahead, I saw a future full of possibilities. I plan to expand my business by opening new cafe locations in other parts of the city and even considered creating my own product line. My ambitions and dreams, which once seemed unreachable to me, now felt like achievable plans. I knew that new challenges would come my way, but I also knew that I had the strength to overcome them. After all, Every obstacle only makes us stronger, and every failure teaches us to appreciate our victories. That's the end of the story. Why do you think the main character's wife committed adultery? Is it right that the main character did not make concessions to his wife's lover and began to stall for time before the divorce? Could the main character have predicted treason? Write your opinion in the comments about this story. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe to the channel, so as not to miss new, equally fascinating stories. Good luck.